Okay, um, welcome to this second part of the standard model theory lecture. In the first part of this semester, you discussed QCD and renormalization. And in the second half of the semester, we will mainly focus on the electroweak standard model, um, sometimes generalized to a general electroweak theory, possibly even beyond the standard model. But mainly, we will discuss the structure um, of the electroweak standard model itself. OK, so let me give you an outline of what we plan to do. So the topic is the electroweak standard model. And um, uh, the goals are, in particular, that I want you to get a thorough understanding of the structure of the standard model like which parts of the standard model, which aspects of its definition lead to which particular consequences, so that you also see how modifications of the standard model in the gauge sector or in the Higgs sector or in the fermion sector would influence different observables. And we want to discuss the standard model extensively at three level, first of all. Because as you have also seen in other lectures, a three level understanding is often um, almost uh, identical to an all orders understanding because three level discussions can often be repeated on the level of slavnov taylor identities for the full theory and then the three level structure repeats itself uh, in the exact theory and then uh, consequences derived at three level can also be understood um, at the all order level so three level will be discussed extensively and uh, then we will discuss also the renormalization of the electroweak standard model in detail, which is a difficult and um, complex topic, and so we will devote some time to it. And then we will also apply it and discuss certain interesting um, one-loop physics examples of the electroweak standard model. Okay, so let me start with the first chapter of this, which is a three-level discussion. And we will first focus on one generation only. And the second section of the um, lecture will then be three level with three generations, where we discuss the specifics of having three generations of uh, fermions. OK, and so I will begin with a brief phenomenological discussion of the phenomenological basis like what are the phenomena which we know which uh, must be described by the standard model. Then we will give the construction of the standard model Lagrangian. We, this is for sure known to most of you or even all of you, but we obviously need to repeat it in order to establish the notation. Then we will study the spontaneous symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism in detail. We will also discuss the BRST formalism in order to understand the physical and unphysical degrees of freedom in the theory. And then we do an application or phenomenological discussion of um, property of the standard model, which is very influential for electroweak physics, namely the so-called custodial symmetry. That is a um, property, I would call it one of the miracles of the standard model. And uh, there will be actually several of those miracles which we discuss, but the custodial symmetry is especially important. So we uh, discuss it here in detail. And at the end, of course, we will summarize uh, this section by giving the Feynman rules uh, for the three level um, standard model. OK, so let us discuss the phenomenological basis. So the first kind of phenomenological basis, in other words, the first kind of observations that we have done in order to um, enforce the standard model description is, of course, we have discovered a lot of particles namely which particles exist. We know uh, all the quarks, all the leptons, and uh, the various gauge bosons. So uh, I just write it here as a list, because obviously you know which particles there are. 
So there are left-handed neutrinos, left-handed electrons, right-handed electrons, left-handed up quarks, left-handed down quarks, right-handed up quarks, right-handed down quarks, and there are the photon W plus minus Z gauge bosons, and there is also the Higgs boson. All these particles exist, they have all been observed, and uh, they have certain properties, masses, and spin, and uh, I do not write down all those properties because you know them anyway, uh, but all, uh, the, let's just summarize all uh, these um, have been observed, and the masses, spins, and other quantum numbers have been determined, and uh, they are in agreement with the predictions of the standard model. So, I do not write it down. Uh, so, uh, obviously, uh, these are spin one-half fermions, uh, these are spin one vector bosons, this is a spin zero Higgs boson with certain um, gauge quantum numbers, electric charges, and so on. The next kind of uh, phenomena which was observed is phenomena at low energies. So that goes back um, to, let's say, the beginning of elementary particle physics, for example, in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, where the first uh, particle accelerators have been constructed, which operated at energies maybe around 1 GeV or below 1 GeV, such that uh, one could not produce directly particles like the WZ boson or the Higgs, but one could study processes between uh, the light particles, namely the first generation fermions, and uh, look at decays of mesons, interactions between mesons and baryons, and so on. And uh, there are two kinds of phenomena which I want to highlight. The first one is QED. So, of course, we know uh, about QED processes, and uh, QED had been established as the correct description of low energy phenomena involving uh, the electromagnetic interaction. That is established, for example, in atomic physics, in chemistry, molecular physics, uh, condensed matter physics, all of that relies on QED. So QED is established as the correct description of low energy processes involving only electromagnetic interactions. So, and consequences of QED are, as I said, atomic physics, chemistry, and uh, or classical electrodynamics, and many more, and all of that had been established. But uh, it was discovered that the electromagnetic interaction is not the only interaction which acts between elementary particles. As you know, there is also the strong interaction, which we neglect today, but in addition, there is the weak interaction. The weak interaction generates or mediates uh, physical processes which cannot be mediated by QED, but which have different um, incoming and outgoing states. And how was the weak interaction observed at low energies? For example, by radioactive decays, by beta decay and by decays of uh, baryons and mesons, and also by the muon, but the muon is not a first generation particle. But by such decays, uh, one could observe the weak interactions. So, let's say beta decay, muon decay, I nevertheless include muon decay because of its importance, but uh, there are also other weak decays, for example, pion decay. And uh, many more such interactions. Uh, they were observed and uh, they cannot be described by QED because 
here, the so-called flavor uh, changes. Um, an up quark is transformed into a down quark, or an electron is transformed into a neutrino, and the electromagnetic interaction never changes this so-called flavor of particles. Therefore, um, these flavor-changing interactions must, co must have corresponded to an um, interaction which um, goes beyond QED, the so-called weak interaction. And by observing this, one could determine properties of the weak interactions. And so, uh, let me just write down something. Uh, so, these decays, for example, V1 decay, was observed to be compatible with the following Feynman diagram. You have an incoming muon, an outgoing muon neutrino. You have here a W minus boson. And in the final state, you have an electron and an anti-neutrino. Uh, in this Feynman diagram, you must assume that this uh, vertex here and also the other vertex is proportional to a coupling constant, let's call it GW, times gamma mu, times the left-handed projection operator 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. And the W boson propagator that you must assume in order to get agreement with the observation is that you can simply say in the numerator you have g mu nu and in the denominator you have q square minus a mass mw square where the q square here can be neglected. So, and therefore the whole uh, discussion of the whole Feynman diagram is in the end proportional to two powers of the coupling constant squared divided by two powers of the mass mw squared and uh, everything else are constants like gamma matrices, metric tensor and so on. So the entire prediction of this diagram is proportional to this combination. So uh, what is the non-trivial fact about this? The non-trivial fact is, first of all, that you have here this gamma mu times left-handed projector interaction at both vertices. This gives rise to a particular angular behavior of the decay products and a certain dependence on the chiralities of the incoming and outgoing fermions. And this particular dependence was in agreement with observation and all other possibilities like 1 plus gamma 5 or no gamma mu, just a unit matrix here and so on. All of those alternatives are not compatible with observation. So by testing all possibilities here, one determined that this is the correct and necessary structure. And uh, the other ingredient is um, that in the propagator, you can approximate this propagator here by a constant, 1 over mw square. And then uh, it uh, tells you that you are not uh, discovering the existence of a W boson here in this way. This is just a Feynman diagram which uh, numerically agrees with your observation. And uh, the only numerical value you can extract from experiment is the combination here between the coupling constant and the mass MW square. And the fact that there is this left-handed coupling. Okay, so this was the status of the observation at low energies. Then uh, there are obviously a phenomena at high energies. And uh, they are available uh, not since the 1950s, but maybe since the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and uh, currently. And there we have in particular so-called electroweak precision observables. They are of particular relevance, and, uh, but they are not, uh, of course, the only observables which are measured at high energies, but uh, let us focus on them. And uh, so the first 
um, observation here is the discovery of the W and Z bosons. And after their discovery, we have a direct measurement of MW and MZ. And we can define an abbreviation of the ratio of the two. Namely, let's define MW divided by MZ is equal to CW, uh, which is 1 minus SW square. So in particular, you can, of course, determine the individual masses, but uh, as a corollary, you can also determine the mass ratio, which is a, di a dimensionless number. CW, which is therefore also an important observable of the standard model. And just to let you know, I will introduce, uh, this is of course uh, an abbreviation of the so-called weak mixing angle, cosine theta, but I will now introduce at least five different cosine theta. They will all differ by the indices. So I call that CW, not uh, theta or theta W or whatever. Let me just check whether this can be seen on the camera. Yeah. So uh, this is the first kind of um, important observables. And uh, the next kind of important precision observable is the structure of interactions. So we can look at effective interactions of uh, vector bosons with spin 1. So after the observation uh, of photon W and Z boson interactions with two fermions. So, and uh, the blob means that I am talking not about the Feynman rule, but about the effective measured interaction strength between uh, the three particles here in question. And this effective interaction strength can be defined somehow experimentally and also somehow in theory. Um, and it will depend on the momenta of all the three particles and so on. So it might be a complicated thing and certainly not just a number. But it is very similar uh, to Feynman rules. So in theory, the uh, three-level contribution to this would be the three-level Feynman rule, but then there would be higher order corrections as well. Okay, but let's denote the observed interactions in this way. Photon with two fermions. And uh, approximately what one finds is the following. Minus I E Q F times gamma mu. So I uh, write the interactions in a way such that they can be directly compared with ordinary Feynman rules. And then what you see here is the ordinary QED Feynman rule for um, this interaction. And we observe that for all energies, um, this is approximately equal to that structure with a certain charge quantum number specific to each fermion. And uh, this becomes exact at low energies by definition of the um, charge E. So the unit of charge or the gauge coupling of QED is defined, uh, at least in one particular uh, definition scheme, so-called on-shell renormalization scheme. It is defined uh, to be exactly the measured interaction strength between the photon and fermions at low energies. Then W, here some fermion F prime, and here another fermion F. So if you similarly look at the W fermion fermion interaction strength at some momenta, then it can be written as follows, minus I E divided by square root of 2 times S theta w gamma mu times a left-handed projector. 
Uh, do you all know what uh, the PL symbol means? Has it been defined already? Okay, it's, it's of course uh, this thing here. I don't know whether it has been defined already in this lecture. 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. So, and now you see here, um, the basic point is that the gamma structure of the interaction has the form gamma mu times a left-handed projector. That is the observation. And then uh, there is a numerical prefactor in front of this gamma structure. And this numerical prefactor is just some number, but uh, I can write any number as the previously defined electric charge divided by some new symbol S theta w. And now I introduce a second S theta w, which might be different or the same as that one over there. So this is just a completely general ansatz for a general numerical free prefactor in front of the left-handed structure. And of course, uh, the measurements tell you that the gamma structure is the one which is seen experimentally, and then you can determine the value of that number by measuring. Okay. Next, set boson interaction with uh, one fermion can be approximately written as follows minus i e divided by 2 s theta z s, uh, sorry, c theta z times now the following gamma mu. And here we have the following gamma structure. We have a gamma mu and then different numerical prefactors in front of uh, the 1 and in front of the gamma 5. Namely, we have i 3f minus 2qf sine square theta effective f minus i3f uh, times gamma 5, where the i3f is equal to the t3 um, weak of the left-handed part of the fermion. So we will see that later, but you know, of course, that uh, those particle multiplets that I wrote here correspond to the field content of the electroweak standard model. There are left-handed fermion doublets, right-handed fermion singlets, and the left-handed fermion doublets have a so-called isospin, weak isospin quantum number. The upper doublet component has isospin plus one half, the lower component has isospin minus one half. That applies only to the left-handed fermions, and the I3F is the abbreviation for any fermion for that iso weak isospin of the fermion's left-handed part. So for an electron, the I3F would be, for example, minus one half. For a neutrino, this I3F would be plus one half, and so on. Okay, and then you see here the following structure, which is again observed experimentally. Namely, uh, you have a gamma mu structure, uh, where gamma mu is multiplied with some linear combination of the unit matrix and gamma five. And you can, of course, without loss of generality, write the coefficient in front of gamma 5 with this i3f, which is a fixed, basically, integer or half integer number. And then the numerical coefficient of this is determined by that prefactor here. And that prefactor, I made an ansatz, the previously defined e, divided by some new symbols s theta z, c theta z. So new mixing angles corresponding to the Z boson interactions. So this is a completely general ansatz, and that number would be determined by measuring the gamma 5 part of this structure here. And then for the unit matrix part, I make a new ansatz, and uh, then this number is already measured. So if you measure the unit matrix, you determine in this way the sine square theta effective for the respective fermion. So it's also a completely general ansatz for uh, the unit matrix. And experimentally, by measuring gamma 5, you determine this. And by measuring the unit matrix, you determine that. 
So we have now uh, two more weak mixing angles, namely the mixing angle S theta C and the mixing angle sine theta effective for the respective fermion. And so for each fermion there is of course a different such uh, sine square theta effective because that relative prefactor might depend on the nature of the fermion. And this is uh, observed, it's approximately true for any momentum and uh, by definition this becomes exact uh, if the momenta are on the Z pole. So if the Z boson is on shell, like in a process where you do E plus E minus going to Z boson and the E plus E minus energy is exactly such that you can produce a Z boson at rest, then the Z boson decays into two fermions, then by definition this becomes exact and so then you have an exact measurement um, prescription to determine this weak mixing angle here. This is in the jargon, this is simply called at the Z pole, where you produce the Z boson basically on shell. So these are three very important effective interactions and so I basically gave you now um, the measurement prescription to determine E S theta W S theta Z sine theta effective. Now one more, namely muon decay. So uh, muon decay is approximately described by this Feynman diagram, but let's say exactly you do muon going to electron, electron antineutrino and muon neutrino. And similarly, you define an effective interaction strength for this and uh, let's give it a name in a certain convention for the normalization. This is called the muon decay constant, G mu or Fermi constant. And that again can be defined to be equal to the following structure, namely E square divided by four square root of two times MW square times C sine theta mu square. And then you have a measurement prescription, measure muon decay that determines uh, unambiguously the value of this muon decay constant. But by definition, uh, you set the muon decay constant equal to that uh, ratio here. E square is already determined, M square is determined, so that effectively determines a measurement prescription for S theta mu. Okay, then you have done all those measurements and what is then the observation? The observation is that up to very small numerical effects or small numerical differences, all these uh, weak mixing angles that I have introduced, which are defined by observations, are almost equal. So let's first say in general, um, all these depend on momenta, etc. But approximately we get uh, SW, which was determined from the mass ratio MW over MZ, is approximately equal to S theta W, which was determined by the W boson interaction, approximately equal to S theta Z, which was determined in the gamma 5 part of the Z interaction, approximately equal to sine theta effective for the respective fermion, which is determined in the 1 part of the Z boson interaction, 
and that is also approximately equal to S theta mu determined in the muon decay. And that is obviously a fundamental and highly non-trivial observational fact which must be described by theory. And now, having said all that, okay, let me write it down. This is what must be described by theory. So having said all that, let me add um, that I introduced all those symbols here for pedagogical purposes. Not all of those symbols are used in the uh, professional literature. So let me highlight the ones which are really used in the literature. Uh, I introduced all the other ones in order to make clear how non-trivial uh, this uh, relationship is and how many quantities are actually related by it. So the important quantities in the literature are this effective weak mixing angle, S theta effective, and uh, the weak mixing angle defined via the masses. And later on, there will be yet another weak mixing angle, which is the one defined in terms of the gauge couplings, which is the one that directly comes out of the structure of the theory. So this is all just pure experiment, but then there is also a natural definition within the theory, which is again different from all of that. Um, okay, but those are the important ones in the literature. And so let me just say the following the example. The ratio between sine square theta effective, if you average over all the leptons, divided by this SW coming out of the mass ratio. This is uh, often denoted as one plus delta kappa lepton. So this delta kappa stands for exactly this ratio. And this is numerically determined as follows. Namely, in the numerator, we have uh, 0.2315 and so on. In the denominator, we have 0 0.22. 2, 6, and so on. So you see here a few percent difference. Not a very large difference, but also not a tiny difference. It's a noticeable difference of a few percent. Similarly, if you do SW square from the mass ratio div divided by S theta mu coming from mu on decay, uh, then you get the following. This is defined as 1 plus delta R, and uh, that is 1 plus 0 0.0354, and so on. So I underline again the quantity which is actually commonly used in the literature, that is the so-called quantity delta R. So instead of introducing the symbol that I introduced, S theta mu, one would introduce the simple delta R in the literature, which is defined exactly in this way using our notation. And then the delta R is the shift between the two uh, mixing angles, and it is a 3% shift. So again, not completely tiny, but um, small. I hope you know that the precision that has been reached in experiment is way, way higher than 3%. The precision is 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 in many cases. Therefore, uh, in terms of the precision that we have, this is a huge effect. And uh, we must uh, do very precise calculations in theory in order to check whether our theory actually agrees with this observation. OK. So this ends um, our discussion of the observational basis. Theory must describe this, and we can say the following about the standard model. The standard model, particularly the electroweak standard model, is the simplest renormalizable quantum field theory, which is in, in agreement with all these observations.
And now a little bit of history. Of course, today when we have uh, this list of observations, we have observed all the particles, including the Higgs, the W and the Z boson, and we have measured very precisely all the interactions of all gauge bosons with all fermions. It is not such a big deal to guess the theoretical structure of the standard model. And uh, however, um, this statement here, that the standard model is the simplest uh, quantum field theory which agrees with observations, that was already the case before the W, Z and the Higgs were discovered. Already there, you could uh, ask yourself, what are the quantum field theories which describe, for example, that muon decay? And you only knew the ratio GW square over MW square. You had not seen the W boson. But already at that point, the standard model uh, was the simplest renormalizable quantum field theory in agreement with all observations. But it was extremely hard to guess the structure of the standard model. And therefore, of course, uh, Weinberg, Lesho, and Salam were awarded the Nobel Prize to come up with the structure of the electroweak standard model. And because it was the simplest quantum field theory in agreement with observation, and because the standard model contains the WZ boson and the Higgs boson, we had predictions. We had predictions that all these bosons must exist with very precisely predicted properties. And all those predicted properties and the existence of the particles were, of course, confirmed later on. That was, of course, a triumph for theory and also for experiment. But we have now all the knowledge from uh, these observations, and therefore our task is much simpler. So let us therefore come to the construction of the standard model Lagrangian. And actually, um, it is not quite right to say that the standard model is defined by its Lagrangian. It's better to say that the standard model is described by its symmetry content, and in particular by its gauge invariance, and by its field content. And therefore, we start by gauge invariance and fields. So the first the thing is we have four, gate, um, four vector bosons which were observed in the electroweak sector, namely photon W plus minus and Z. And uh, if you know the structure of gauge theories, then you know that for each uh, generator of the gauge group, there is an associated gauge boson which becomes a vector boson particle. Therefore, we need a gauge group with four generators. And we know that the W boson has electric charge. Therefore, the W boson must interact with a photon. So we have self-interactions between the gauge bosons, like W plus, W minus, gamma, and some others. Therefore, we know that the gauge group must be non-abelian, because in an abelian gauge group, uh, there are no self-interactions between the gauge bosons. So the simplest gauge group which uh, can appear, which can be in agreement with all these observations, must be a gauge group with exactly four generators. More than four would be uh, not the simplest one. So four generators, but non-abelian. And the simplest example of this, or the only example, is SU2 cross U1. Therefore, our gauge group for the electroweak sector is uh, SU2 left cross U1 for the so-called hypercharge. And let me nevertheless add in brackets here SU3 color times uh, that to have here in front of us the full gauge group of the entire standard model. But this is the electroweak sector with uh, one gauge factor with three generators, the three Pauli matrices, for example, and an abelian group with one generator overall. We have four generators and a non-abelian gauge group. Having fixed the gauge group, we can immediately write down 
the general form of the gauge covariant derivative. Capital D mu is equal to the ordinary derivative plus, in my convention, uh, I times uh, the sum of the products of generators times gauge bosons. And here we must have um, generators and gauge bosons separately for each factor of the gauge group. Let me again also insert here QCD, even though we will uh, afterwards neglect it. So maybe in brackets, the QCD part would be a gauge coupling GS times generators TSA times gluon fields GA mu, where this color index A runs from 1 to 8 for the 8 generators of SU3. Then uh, for the electroweak part, we have GW times TA WA mu, where this A is the weak isospin index. A runs from 1 to 3. And then we have a part corresponding to the so-called hypercharge Y, namely a gauge coupling GY times the hypercharge generator capital Y times the corresponding gauge field B mu. That is the structure of the covariant derivative. So we have here the four so-called generators of the gauge group T123 and Y and uh, the four gauge fields, namely W, A, mu, and B, mu. Now, let me fix immediately one interpretation such that you can imagine something uh, for hypercharge. Certainly, you know it already, but the interpretation is that we relate uh, these generators to the electric charge of particles or fields Q as T3 plus the hypercharge Y. So uh, this relationship will be uh, justified later on. But let's write it down already here such that you can interpret something or have an um, understanding of where the values of the hypercharge come from. They always come from this relationship. Uh, by inverting this relationship, you can determine what must be the hypercharge of all the different fields in the theory. So whether this interpretation is actually possible and can be um, kept uh, consistently in the discussion of the whole theory, we might not know that yet, but it will be possible. And so let's fix this already now. So in this way, we have fixed the gauge group and we have also fixed part of the field content of the theory, namely we have fixed the gauge fields, which are the four gauge fields W and B. Now the next uh, construction in a gauge theory is to specify which meta fields there are. Meta fields by definition are all fields which are not the gauge fields. And here we have two kinds of meta fields, namely the Higgs field and the fermions. Let's start with the Higgs field, which is a so-called Higgs doublet. Doublet means doublet in the sense of the SU2 gauge group. We call it capital Phi. And uh, let me be very explicit with specifying how the generators of the gauge group act. So, you know, these generators here um, must act in a way which is compatible with the uh, commutational relations between them. For example, the generators TA must satisfy the SU2 commutation relations, which means T1 commutator with T2 is I times T3 and so on. Uh, this uh, is just a number because it's a billion. This would have to satisfy the algebra corresponding to SU3. And, uh, but nevertheless, the exact values of the generators depend on which fields they act on. So I must now specify how the generators are defined if they act onto the Higgs field. And I will do that quite explicitly, at least for the first few cases. So if you act 
with a QCD generator TS on a Higgs field, what happens is you get zero. The generators, remember, they generate infinitesimal gauge transformations. So if the generator acts on phi and gives zero, it means that phi is invariant under QCD gauge transformations. That is the obvious and simple fact. It has nothing to do with QCD color charge and therefore it stays whatever it is under a QCD gauge transformation. And so the corresponding generator maps uh, phi to zero. In other words, uh, in the context of the Higgs field, the generator is just the number zero. What happens if we act with the SU2 generators onto the Higgs? This is a doublet and uh, that means in terms of SU2 the generators are given by one half times the Pauli matrices. So this is now specifically sigma A over 2 multiplied with this Higgs doublet. And this is a two component object such that it makes sense to multiply the Pauli matrix two by two with this two component object. So you can say TA equals sigma A over two uh, if you act on a Higgs field. So what about the hypercharge? Hypercharge can be fixed by uh, thinking of this relationship. We want uh, that the charge of the Higgs doublet is such that in the upper component we have charge plus one, in the lower component we have charge zero, and uh, therefore um, Y is basically the average of the two uh, charges, so Y must be one half. One half times the Higgs field, so uh, in other words, the hypercharge of the Higgs doublet is one half. And then if you go back into this relationship here, you see that in the upper doublet component, T3 is plus one half, plus one half gives one in the upper component, and in the lower component, you have minus one half plus one half gives zero. Okay, and all of that can be summarized by saying that the Higgs field is a so-called one comma two comma one half representation of the gauge group. Okay. So you can summarize all these equations uh, by this statement. One means singlet, uh, so it is invariant under QCD gauge transformations that corresponds to that equation. Two means it is an SU2 doublet, therefore uh, the generators are replaced by Pauli matrix over two, corresponding to a doublet, and the hypercharge is one half. So this statement summarizes these three equations. Then, Let's go to the next quark left-handed doublet. Let's call it Q L I. Where this I here corresponds to the color index. I runs from one to three corresponds to the QCD color charge. Okay, so you have an index. There are three quarks of the first generation uh, of each flavor corresponding to the three different colors. Then, so what happens if we act with the generators on it? First, strong interactions, TAS, acting on the quark um, uh, left-handed. So now, this acts in a non-trivial way because they do have color charge. And what color charge do they have? They are a so-called color triplet corresponding to the index I runs from one to three. Therefore, we must replace the QCD generators by the triplet generators, which are the so-called Gelman matrices, lambda A over two. And what is the index structure? This matrix acts directly on this color index. So we would write this here as this overall with an index i. And uh, the meaning is that you get here a Gelman matrix lambda a over two with index ij times ql 
index j summed over j, of course. So Ts is now given by one half times the Gelman matrices, which are the so-called fundamental representation or triplet representation of SU3. Then, how, but we will not use that, of course, because we focus on electroweak physics. But then, uh, what are the weak generators, Ta, acting on QL, I? So in this sense, QL is a doublet. It consists of, let me write that here, it consists of UL, I, and DLI. So that is the structure. It is a um, doublet with two components, two entries. Each entry still has a color index, but anyway, it has this two component structure. And the weak generators TA directly act onto this two component structure uh, in the same way as for the Higgs. So we get sigma A over 2 times QL with the same index I. So the SU2 is blind to the color index I, but it uh, transforms this doublet structure. So in simply uh, put, we can again simply say the weak generators are replaced by one half times the Pauli matrices. Then hypercharge. Hypercharge of the left-handed quark doublet is again such that the hypercharge corresponds to the average of the two electric charges. So here we have electric charge plus two th uh, third, here minus one third, the average is plus one over six. So the hypercharge must be one over six. And then we have again defined the action of all generators of the gauge group onto the quark doublet. And all of this can be summarized by saying it is a 3, 2, 1 over 6 representation of the gauge group. 3 stands for triplet, which immediately means Ts becomes 1 half Gelman, and that means the same as before and this as well. And uh, in this way, we have to go on to specify the entire field content. Let me just clean the blackboard. Okay, uh, where are we? So we have now the Higgs doublet, quark doublet. Let us go on with the lepton doublet. Let's call it capital L, subscript L. This L stands for left-handed, of course, which consists of the left-handed electron neutrino and the left-handed electron. and it has the following quantum numbers, namely it is invariant under QCD color gauge transformation, so Ts again is zero. It is an SU2 doublet, so Ta is replaced by sigma A over two, and it has hypercharge minus one half, because minus one half is the average of the two electric charges, and so it can be written as a 1, 2, minus 1 half representation of the uh, standard model gauge group. Then we have uh, quark singlets. On the one hand, U, R, I. So this is a right-handed up quark electroweak singlet. So it is a color triplet, Ts, acting on this. I is as before for the quark doublet, given by Gelman matrices, Ij, Urj, uh, the same as before. But now, uh, for the first time, we have something which is an electroweak singlet. That means the Ta generators for SU2, they leave uh, this invariant, which means the generators map it to zero, because the singlet is invariant under SU2 gauge transformations. And hypercharge, according to that formula which we have over there, Ta is now zero, therefore the hypercharge is equal to the electric charge, which is here two-thirds. 
similarly for the right-handed down quark singlets. Okay, or let me just say it like this. Maybe so this is now a 3, 1, 2 third representation. Okay. And now for all the other ones I can just use the shorthand notation, namely DRI uh, in a similar way is also a 3, 1, 1 third representation which means that it transforms in the same way under color, it transforms in the same way under SU2, but it has a different electric charge and therefore a different hypercharge, so that is the only difference. And then the lepton singlet. Which I call small e r. This is which representation. So can anybody guess or tell us what would be the representation of the electron right-handed singlet? So what is its color representation? How would it transform under color SU3 gauge transformations? One. One, in the same way as all the other leptons. So one. How does it transform under SU2 gauge transformations in the same way as what? as the quark singlets, so it has here a one, so the TAs are zero. And then, like for the quark singlets, hypercharge equals electric charge, which is minus one. So here, that is what we have. And so, in the end, you only need to know uh, these sort of statements, which is exactly what you would say in words. In words, you would simply say, ah, we have a, a right-handed electron singlet under SU2 with electric charge minus one, and then you know this, and uh, then you can reconstruct how all the generators act. Because nobody would uh, need to remember uh, these equations or learn them by heart. <laughs> you must know that these equations automatically are a consequence if you specify this data. Okay, and uh, so then we have specified the full field content of the standard model. And the gauge invariance is then the requirement that the Lagrangian should be invariant under the corresponding gauge transformations. So you have discussed non-abelian gauge theories already in this lecture at the beginning of the semester and also in the parallel quantum field theory two lecture, we have discussed abelian and non-abelian gauge theories. And so whenever you know what is the gauge group and what are the meta fields, you automatically know exactly how the gauge transformations must look like. So I do not write them down because they can be reconstructed uh, straightforwardly from all the information on the blackboard and then we also know what it means to say that the Lagrangian should be invariant. So no need to uh, waste time in writing down the corresponding equations because they are simply contained in that information. Let us go on. The next step is the Lagrangian. And as I said, the standard model is really defined by the field content and by the symmetry content, and therefore the Lagrangian is a consequence um, of what is written on the blackboard and uh, doesn't need to be defined uh, separately. So L is defined as the uh, most general um, local relativistic um, renormalizable Lagrangian, which is invariant under 
the above gauge transformations. Okay. That is the definition. And therefore, it just remains to work out what is the most general Lagrangian uh, in agreement with um, this. And generally speaking, we know from the general discussion of gauge theories, how does a general gauge invariant Lagrangian look like? A general gauge invariant Lagrangian looks like this, that it might depend on the field strength tensors, F mu nu, corresponding to all the gauge fields, because they are gauge covariant objects. In addition, it might depend on covariant derivatives, but it must not depend on ordinary derivatives separately. It must only depend on covariant derivatives. And then it might depend on all the meta fields. And that means, of course, it can depend on covariant derivatives of the meta fields, but it cannot depend on ordinary derivatives of the meta fields. And then uh, I do not uh, copy again that it must be local and relativistic, that is so, let's say, clear that let's not repeat this. But what does it mean that the Lagrangian is renormalizable? It means that in the Lagrangian, there must at most appear terms composed out of those fields and derivatives, which are of dimension four or less. So uh, this gives rise to a sum of operators times coefficients Operators mean any combinations of fields and derivatives, and each operator which can appear in the Lagrangian in the sum must have dimension four or less. So this at most dimension equal or smaller than four terms. because uh, everything else would then uh, violate renormalizability. Okay, and with that in mind, we can write down the Lagrangian. I am sure that all of you know the standard model Lagrangian from the T-shirts and the CERN cups and so on. And uh, so basically we just write it down and comment a little bit on the uh, individual terms, but uh, you will see that they all correspond to that structure. As you know from the cup and the t-shirt and so on, the Lagrangian has four lines, which is a very neat way to split up the Lagrangian into the four different contributions from the gauge bosons, from the kinetic terms of the meta fields, from the Higgs potential, and uh, from the Higgs fermion interaction, the so-called Yukawa interactions. And we will use basically the same split into the respective terms. So let us begin with the kinetic terms. Um, there are gauge kinetic terms, first of all, L gauge, which is the sum of all the squares of the field strength tensors corresponding to an abelian or non-abelian gauge theory. So I will, again, here for the last time, maybe write, including QCD, GA mu nu times GA mu nu, which would be the field strength tensor corresponding to the gluons, which we will drop afterwards minus 1 over 4 wa mu nu, wa mu nu, minus 1 over 4 b mu nu, b mu nu, where these correspond to the field strength tensors corresponding to SU2 and U1. And let me just say as an example, you can get the field strength tensor from commutators of covariant derivatives. So for example, wa mu nu, contracted with the SU2 generators TA is given by 1 divided by I times the gauge coupling GW times the commutator of two covariant derivatives, d mu d nu, and from that only the SU2 part. That gives you the field strength tensor corresponding to SU2. And then uh, you can extract the individual uh, WAs by taking some traces with respect to other T, Bs, and so on. So this defines uh, implicitly all the WAs. 
the gluon field strength tensor is defined in the same way and the BME nu is defined in the same way. And for the non-abelian um, cases, you have non-trivial commutators between generators and then here on the right hand side you have non-linear terms in the actual field. But for the abelian case where the generators commute, you only have linear terms on the right hand side. And so for the non-abelian case, you get self-interactions between the gauge bosons from those terms. From the abelian case, you do not get self-interactions between gauge bosons. And as we already discussed, we need self-interactions because of the interaction of the W with the photon. So that is contained in here. Okay, these are the gauge kinetic terms. Then we have the meta kinetic terms, which uh, are, first of all, covariant derivative of the Higgs doublet squared, because that is the correct Lorentz invariant kinetic term for a scalar field, but gauge invariant, and so we use the gauge covariant derivative. Then we have the same for the fermions. Let's start with the quark. QL i bar times i gamma mu d mu QL i. That would be the correct kinetic term for a fermion. And uh, it is also Lorentz and gauge invariant. And then we have similar terms for all the other fermions. And that describes the kinetic terms of all the meta fields and uh, because of the gauge covariant derivative at the same time this describes of course the interaction between the meta fields and all the gauge bosons. For example it describes what we had here somewhere on the blackboard these interactions photon FF or Z boson 2,2 two, two fermions W 2,2 two, two fermions. This is described by those terms in the Lagrangian. Then the next is the Higgs potential. So we write L Higgs potential is equal to minus the V of phi. So uh, by convention, of course, the potential appears with a minus sign in the Lagrangian. And let us directly specify the value of the potential. And uh, the conventions I want to use are minus mu square times phi absolute value square plus lambda times phi absolute value to the fourth power. And so in this way, uh, we make explicit here the Mexican head structure of the Higgs potential uh, if mu, is, mu square is positive then we have here a negative term and we get this typical uh, Mexican head or wine bottle potential. And for lambda, there are also many different conventions available. Uh, some people put here a lambda, some people put lambda over two, some people put lambda over four. And uh, this convention that I am using here is the one which is typically used, um, for example, by uh, De Grassi et al who discussed the vacuum stability of the standard model, which is an extremely important application of uh, the Higgs potential, where they calculate higher order corrections to the Higgs potential and ask whether including higher order corrections, it still remains a Mexican head or whether it changes its shape. And so since these are very important studies of the Higgs potential, I use here uh, their convention for lambda but other conventions are equally possible. So gauge kinetic, meta kinetic, Higgs potential term, and the last uh, remaining one are the Yukawa interactions. So L Yukawa is uh, the following minus Yukawa coupling for uh, the electron. So this letter here is a small e, ye for electron. Then capital LL bar phi er. Okay, 
So what you see here is the Higgs doublet, which is an SO2 doublet. Then the lepton doublet, left-handed, barred, such that in combination we get um, a Hermitian adjoint doublet times a normal doublet, and the product of the two gives something which is obviously SU2 invariant because the doublet structure is compensated. And then uh, we have here a product between two fermions, a left-handed fermion barred times a right-handed fermion, and that is a non-trivial Lorentz invariant expression how you can multiply two fermion fields. So the fermion structure, Lorentz structure is okay, SU2 structure is okay because a barred doublet times doublet times singlet is SU2 invariant, and you can check the hypercharges. That has hypercharge minus one, hypercharge plus one half, hypercharge minus one half, but complex conjugated, so the hypercharges add up to zero, and so it is also invariant under the hypercharge gauge transformations. So this term makes sense from the point of view of Lorentz invariance, and it is fully gauge invariant and it corresponds to an interaction of two leptons and a Higgs. Let's go on. We have also the same for the down quark, Yd, times the quark doublet, QLI, for each color, times the Higgs doublet, times DRI. And uh, we simply sum over the colors. The Higgs has no color, therefore uh, we trivially sum over the three colors of this. And again, we have anti doublet times doublet is uh, SU2 invariant. The hypercharges are here minus one over six plus one half minus one over three gives zero. So it's fully gauge invariant and it makes sense from the Lorentz invariance point of view. And as you know, what is the output or outcome of these terms? the masses of the leptons and quarks, right? You know that, don't you? Okay. So what is missing is the up quark. So how does it look like for the up quark? Let's uh, first write down something which looks like that. Let's simply uh, write it and uh, now study it, but maybe with a bar. So this also makes sense from the Lorentz invariance and Spinor point of view. But what about gauge invariance? Now SU2, uh, anti-doublet times doublet gives a singlet. That is okay, but what about hypercharges? They cannot add up to zero because this is the same, this is the same, that is different, and so uh, the hypercharges add up to zero here, but here they don't because that is just has the wrong hypercharge. So how can we obtain a term which gives rise to masses for the up quarks? Not in this way. So we need another way. And if you just look blindly, then uh, the hypercharges here are minus one over six plus two over three give plus one half. If we do that, then the hypercharges add up to zero. But then we have uh, anti-doublet times anti-doublet. That is not obviously gauge invariant and so under SU2. So we need to do something and what we can do is the following. Let us exhibit the individual SU2 components. So let's put here index A, index B. A, B stands for the two components of the SU2 doublets. And let's multiply it with the epsilon tensor, epsilon A, B. Where Epsilon AB is anti-symmetric, equal to minus Epsilon BA. Epsilon 1, 2 is equal to plus 1. So that is the Epsilon tensor, and the A stands for the um, SU2 doublet components. Then the third term is actually also gauge invariant, and we have to prove that, of course. Good, but uh, that is first of all the Lagrangian, and so the sum of all the terms is electroweak standard model Lagrangian is equal to the gauge kinetic terms 
plus the metakinetic terms plus the Higgs potential plus the Yukawa sectpole. These are the four lines of the electroweak Lagrangian. So maybe uh, let me end the lecture by a few comments. So first of all, uh, let us check the gauge invariance of these terms. Let's first say all terms are obviously gauge invariant except for this last one. Okay, maybe for some the last term is also obvious, but it is uh, less, let's say, less obvious than for all the other ones. Let us first check, is it true that all the other terms are obviously gauge invariant? So, if you have a covariant derivative, the thing transforms as the original object without the derivative. And so, therefore, it is clear that this is gauge invariant because of the phi square. This is gauge invariant because of the Q dagger Q. So, all the gauge transformations always obviously drop out out of those terms. The gauge kinetic terms are, of course, gauge invariant because of the construction of non abelian gauge theories. That was non trivial, but we constructed it, and so, therefore, this is just knowledge. And this is obviously gauge invariant because of the absolute value square. This is gauge invariant as we discussed, and so the only non-obvious term which remains to be discussed is the last one. Therefore, let us discuss it. Let us discuss how it transforms under a gauge transformation. And the only thing that we need to check is SU2, because it's obviously invariant under color, QCD, and it's also obviously invariant under hypercharge, because that is how it was constructed. Let us only check SU2. So then we write down only the SU2 part, namely this QA um, times phi B dagger. So that is, you take uh, either the upper or the lower component of the doublet and dagger it. And here you take either the upper or the lower component of the doublet and bar it. And then you multiply with epsilon and sum over A and B. So now you do an SU2 L gauge transformation. Now what happens? So the epsilon is just a numerical prefactor that uh, doesn't do anything, but the Q transforms, namely Q transforms by an SU2 matrix. And so I will now not use the infinitesimal form, but I will use the finite gauge transformations where uh, I just know that a doublet is multiplied with an SU2 matrix. So that is now our SU2 matrix. It's a unitary uh, un uh, two by two matrix with determinant one. And that is multiplied with our doublet. And after multiplying the matrix with the doublet, I extract the component A. So I can write this as U A A prime times Q L i a prime. That combination here gives me the gauge transformed Q L a. And all of that is barred. Then the Higgs field, so the Higgs doublet first of all transforms also with the same SU2 matrix, namely it transforms into Q uh, U B B prime times phi B prime. That is simply the transformation of the field phi b. And now all of that is daggered, because we need here phi b dagger. So that is the gauge transformation of phi b dagger step. So that is the following, epsilon a b. And so let us exhibit the appearance of the SU2 matrix. So here we have the bar. Bar means uh, is an operation for spinors, which involves complex conjugation. 
So this is a numerical prefactor in front of the spinor. So for the numerical prefactor, the only thing that the bar is doing is complex conjugation. So we get here u star matrix element a a prime, and then q a prime l i bar. And here, uh, that is a numerical prefactor for any index b b prime. So the decker just means complex conjugation again, u star b b prime and then times phi b prime dagger. And uh, now I've just rewritten the term, and what do you discover? You discover here a combination of mathematical objects, namely an anti-symmetric tensor times uh, a matrix, twice written in this way, and I hope you have seen this construction before, in mathematics, namely, what is this? That is the definition of a determinant of a matrix, isn't it? So that is by definition equal to epsilon a prime b prime times the determinant of the matrix u star. So for example, if you put a prime equal to uh, one and b prime equal to two, so you have here epsilon one, two is one, okay, one, two. Then you see here a prime becomes one, b prime becomes two, then you see here epsilon a b times u a one, u b two, and then what the product gives you is the product u one, one times u two, two minus u one, two times u two, one. That is exactly the determinant. So and this works also for uh, matrices which are not two by two, it works for n by n matrices. You would have to put here an anti-symmetric tensor with n indices and here n factors of your matrix with that sort of structure and then you always get the determinant of the matrix times the remaining epsilon. So that is a general mathematical definition of a determinant. What is the determinant of u star? In our case, we are U star is an SU2 matrix. It is one. It is one. And therefore, the thing is gauge invariant. That is the reason. Then we have here. And now if you look at it, you literally see on the right-hand side of the equation the identical object as on the left-hand side of the equation just the index got relabeled A to A prime, B to B prime, but otherwise it is identical. And so we have proven the gauge invariance of this object, and it is related to the fact that our determ uh, matrices have determinant one. It's a SU2 matrix. And uh, okay, as a side remark, uh, maybe you discussed it also with Peter in the other part of the lecture. So. Um, you can generally do this also with SUN gauge groups. If you have an SUN gauge group, you can always write down such an expression where you have an epsilon tensor with N indices and here a product of N objects in the fundamental representation. And then this thing would be gauge invariant. So in SU2, it is just a two-dimensional epsilon tensor and a product of two doublets that it gives something gauge invariant. The counterpart in QCD would be you have here an epsilon with three indices and a product of three quark fields which are color triplets. So three color triplets multiplied with an epsilon tensor gives something color gauge invariant. And that has a physical interpretation, namely baryons. Baryons make use of this. Baryons are gauge invariant objects which are composed of three quark fields, each in the fundamental representation of SU3, and you can connect them using the epsilon tensor in this way. And therefore, um, the generalization would be that in every SUN gauge group, you have two ways to generate gauge invariant combinations of your fundamental objects. One way is the obvious one, a BART, 
uh, object times an unbarred object is gauge invariant in the QCD case that would correspond to mesons, which are composed of one antiquark and one quark, which directly is color gauge invariant. But in all these SUN gauge groups, you have also this epsilon times n objects, where n stands for SUN. And that corresponds to baryons in QCD. So for any SUN gauge group, you have something analog to baryons, which would always consist of n fundamental objects placed next to each other and combined with an epsilon tensor. And in SU2, it just happens that the baryons are composed of two objects, uh, like the mesons. So this would be a mesonic structure. That would be baryonic structure in the language of QCD. OK, but anyway, uh, that proves that uh, all terms are gauge invariant. The next note is, of course, um, that is not obvious, but you can check it, and you can uh, prove that there is no other gauge invariant term with dimension uh, less or equal to 4. So we have really um, collected all gauge invariant terms. <coughs> Maybe as a further uh, remark, except the so-called theta QCD term, which is a total derivative. So one could add terms which are gauge invariant, but which are total derivatives, and they are of interest for non-perturbative physics, but they can be neglected here. So these are important and kind of obvious remarks. Let me also make a few further remarks. So first of all, there is no explicit fermion mass term. Because um, mass terms for fermions would look like this. For example, a um, left-handed electron bar times a right-handed electron. This is a mass term for an electron field, but this is not gate invariant. And the same is true for all other possible mass terms for all fermions in the standard model. We cannot write down gate invariant mass terms. And that is only true because of the weak interactions. This term is perfectly gauge invariant under QCD, and also all the quark mass terms are perfectly gauge invariant under QCD, and also under QED gauge transformations, this is also gauge invariant, but the weak interactions make it non-gauge invariant. So that is very important. So all the fermion masses of the standard model must be generated um, in a different way, not by explicit mass terms, but as you know, from coupling to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. And this is something that is, which is not um, true for all particles in all theories. It's a specific property of the standard model and the specific quarks and leptons which we want to describe for them such explicit mass terms are uh, not gauge invariant. Then, uh, another remark, all terms in the Lagrangian are exactly dimension equal to four. So we had the requirement four or less, but actually all terms are exactly equal uh, to dimension four, except one. So. By dimension four, I mean, for example, this term, the Higgs field has dimension one, a derivative has dimension one, so the product here has dimension four, and the prefactor is one is dimensionless. So this is a dimension four term. Similar, a quark field has dimension three over two, derivative has dimension one, the product has dimension four, and so on. You can go through all the terms, all of them have dimension four. Here again, fermion plus fermion plus scalar dimension four. There is only one single term in the entire Lagrangian which doesn't have dimension four, and it also doesn't have dimension three, but it has dimension two, and that is the Higgs mass term, mu squared, 
to mi uskuje tam. So this is the only term which generates a dimension full scale in the standard model. Without that term, the entire Lagrangian would be scale invariant and would not contain any uh, thing which defines a unit of energy or unit of length or mass. That is interesting and maybe now uh, time is up. That is a little bit unfortunate, but we have another lecture in the afternoon, so then I can add uh, our first or maybe second miracle of the standard model. Uh, let's do that at the beginning of the next lecture. Okay, uh, so see you in the afternoon. <laughs>